Hello, and welcome to your first lecture on transformers. And no, we're not talking about that kind of transformer, but we are talking about a really exciting state-of-the-art model to process sequences. In our recurrent neural network lectures, we talked a little bit about different ways we might want to use sequences when building deep learning models. One of the really common ones might be something like machine translation, in which we put in a sequence to a model and ask it to create a hidden representation of the meaning of that sentence. Then we might ask a different part of the model to take that latent hidden representation and create a new sequence, for instance, translating the first sequence that was in English to a sentence in Spanish. And the recurrent architectures that we talked about in the previous lectures were really state of the art for a long time for this type of task, which is a sequence to sequence task. For instance, we could have an LSTM that takes in a sentence, encodes its representation through the process of sending it through the LSTM cell, and then have another LSTM that is then going to take that hidden representation and translate it into a different language. This decoder basically takes that hidden representation and generates a new sequence item by item. And this type of encoder decoder structure should actually be pretty familiar to you because in our autoencoders lecture, we talked about a very simple version of this structure where we have an encoder whose job is to take in some input and create some type of hidden representation of it. And then a decoder that takes that hidden representation and tries to recreate the output. But the autoencoders that we looked at, even though they were fancy and nonlinear, were still using just feed forward densely connected layers, or at the most, maybe some convolutional layers. But what if we had an autoencoder architecture whose encoder and decoder were recurrent neural networks? This is exactly what was proposed by Cho et al. in 2014 when the GRU was proposed. The paper proposed an architecture where the encoder and the decoder were both gated recurrent units. The first GRU would produce this hidden state, which was then fed to the decoder GRU and influence what type of sequence it was going to create. As I mentioned before, this is great for things like machine translation. We want to input one sequence and have it output another sequence, either summarized or translated in some way. And this generally is the encoder decoder model. We have an input sequence and then we use an encoder to create some type of hidden representation of something like the meaning of the sentence that we input. And then we have the decoder whose job it is to take that hidden representation and create a new output sequence. This could be the original sentence translated into a different language or maybe a summarization of a really long document. So encoder decoder architectures are nothing new to us, which is good because that's exactly what transformer models are. They have this encoder section and a decoder both of which take in and produce sequences. When this architecture was proposed in 2017, it was specifically looking at machine translation tasks. However, over the past few years, transformer architectures have taken over pretty much all sequence processing models. Just like we talked about with the general encoder decoder model, the transformer has a portion that is the encoder. It takes in things like words, processes them, and creates a hidden representation. That representation, shown here in red, is then fed into the decoder. The decoder then takes that information as well as its own inputs and produces another sequence. So even though this architecture looks a lot more complicated than what we're used to seeing, it is still that basic encoder-decoder structure. As I mentioned, the 2017 paper, Attention is All You Need, proposed the transformer architecture, but it's really blown up since then and has taken over pretty much any task where you're going to process sequences. And in today's lecture, we're actually only gonna focus on what happens to data before it's fed into the encoder or decoder, this section right here.
And while the paper is titled, Attention is All You Need, which might make you think that attention is the most important thing about this paper, I actually think what we're going to cover today, which is positional encoding, is a huge breakthrough in these types of models. The first thing you need to understand about what happens when we take different words and try and feed them into our model is something we've already learned, which is word embeddings. From the diagram, you can see that we're taking in words and we are feeding them into a portion of the model that creates word embeddings. And we've seen word embeddings before, for instance, when we talked about word to vec. Remember, word embeddings are non-sparse, usually lower dimensional vectors that represent the semantic meaning of a word, meaning vectors that are close together should have similar meanings or at least similar context. This is an example of what a very simple word embedding might look like for the words gorgeous and python. One thing that we want to keep track of for this lecture is the dimension of this embedding space. We're going to call this D model and it just keeps track of what the dimensions of our embedding space is. In this case, it would be one, two, three, four, five, six. Now, you might notice that once we put our words through the embedding process to get these non-sparse, hopefully lower dimensional vector representations, we do something else called positional encoding. And positional encoding is especially powerful. Before we talk about what it is, let's talk about why. When you have a typical recurrent model, unlike the transformer, and we have a sequence that we would like it to process, for instance, the cat ate the bat, we feed those words in sequentially. For instance, first we would feed in the word the, then we would feed in the word cat, then the word ate, then the word the, and lastly the word bat. This is what empowers recurrent architectures to process information sequentially and take advantage of information that it's learned about previous inputs in the sequence. However, this makes these types of models slow to train and not parallelizable, because if we're processing an entire sequence, we have to feed it into the model one item at a time. And it's not like we can take that sequence and break it up and send it to different cores on our computer. But feeding these words in sequentially is what gives us the power to take advantage of the sequential information in our sequence. So what do we do? Well, we don't feed our words in one by one in a transformer. Instead, we feed all of the words in a sequence into the model at a single time. This has the advantage of being parallelizable and a lot faster than feeding in data sequentially. However, it does leave us with a bit of a problem. Sequentially processing the data is what allowed recurrent architectures to learn about information in a sequential way, and we just totally got rid of that. So if we're not feeding in words sequentially, we need to figure out some way to still tell the model what the position of that word is in the sequence. And that is exactly what positional encoding does. Positional encoding is a way to take our word embeddings that we've already generated and inject information about where in a sequence a word occurs. We're going to do that by taking a vector that is the same dimensions as our embedding vector and adding it to our embedding vector. This will basically inject the positional information that we want to know about the items in our sequence. So when we're done with this process, we are going to have an embedding that takes into account both the semantic meaning of the word, which comes from the original word embedding, as well as positional information, which is going to come from the positional encoding. But how do we create these positional encodings? Let's look at this sequence. Your Python code is gorgeous. And here we have all of the embeddings for these words. One way we could encode positional information that's pretty easy is to just add a vector that tells us what the index of this item in the sequence is. For instance, the word your is at index zero, so we would add a vector of zeros to it. For the word python, it's at index one, so we could add a vector of ones to it. For the word code, it is at index two, so we could add a vector of twos to it. 
And this would indeed add positional information to our word embeddings. But as we get longer and longer sequences, the indices that we're going to be adding are going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. And what's going to happen is it's going to overwhelm the semantic information coming from our actual word embeddings, just because the positional information is going to be such large numbers. So if we don't want numbers that are that large, what if we scaled our values? So instead of using the indices like 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, instead we used a scaled version where we took all of them and had the first index be 0, the last be 1, and everything else in between be a value between 0 and 1. Essentially, we're taking these original indices and dividing them by the largest index. And that would definitely be a valid way to do this. We could take our original vector, the first one we would add, still zeros. But for the second one, instead of adding a vector of ones, we add a vector of 0 0.25. Well, that solves one of the problems, which is that we don't have positional encodings that are going to drown out the information in our word embeddings. However, it does have another problem. It assumes that we know the length of our sequence, and that is not always going to be the case. So we've talked about two good ideas for encoding positional information that don't quite hit all of the things that we want. First, we of course want to actually encode position and all of the things that we've tried so far do indeed do that. However, we also have the problems that we don't want any large numbers. We basically don't want to overwhelm the information coming from the word embeddings by adding super huge numbers for our positional encoding. And last, we want our models to be able to adapt to variable sequence lengths. We don't want to have to specify what the sequence length is ahead of time. So how could we possibly do that? Well, what about some sine and cosine waves? The pros of sine and cosine are that they're bounded values. No matter what you input into the sine and cosine, their outputs are always going to be between negative 1 and positive 1. So we've solved the issue of having values that are going to be huge. The next pro is that sine and cosine are functions that can go on forever, meaning that no matter how long our sequence is, we can still encode positional information about it. However, a problem that we have is that sine and cosine are periodic functions, which means they repeat their values every so often. If we look at this diagram, let's look at this last sine wave here. Here we have a sine wave that has a pretty high frequency and in fact when we look at the item with position 1 and the item at position 3, we see that they have the exact same sine value and that's problematic because obviously these are very different positions in the sequence. So what if instead of using one sine wave we used multiple? Now if we look at a combination of all four of these sine waves that have different frequencies, we start to see some differences between our positions 1 and our position 3. Thus, if we consider all of the sine waves together, we can get unique information about where in a sequence something is located. And that's exactly what the Attention is All You Need paper does. In order to encode positional information, they use a combination of sine and cosine functions. These sine and cosine functions have a couple of different variables. First, we look at the position of the word. We also have this constant term d, which tells us the dimension of our embedding vectors, basically how many entries we have in this positional encoding vector. And last but not least, we have this variable i. i tells us where in the positional encoding vector these values will appear. If you imagine we have a really long positional encoding vector, low values of i will occur higher up in this vector, and high values of i will occur later in the vector. Other than those variables, these are pretty basic sine and cosine functions. In order to create our positional encoding vector, we are going to add pairs of sine and cosine functions with the variables that we just talked about. And as you can see here, we're adjusting i as we move down through the vector. Now, because we're adding pairs of sine and cosine entries, we only need to add d over 2 pairs in order to actually get a vector that is the same length as our word embedding. So instead of i being 0 all the way up to d, the number of dimensions in our vector, we actually loop from 0 all the way to d over 2. 
That way we have d over 2 pairs, aka d total entries in our vector. That's why you see these repeated values. You see 0 and 0 here, and then 1 and 1 here, because we are actually creating pairs of sine and cosines. If your brain works better in code, here's a bit of pseudocode that would help you run this. Here we are defining the positional encoding vector for a single position. Here it's going to be the position 0. In this case, our dimensions of our word embeddings and therefore our positional encodings is going to be 6. That means we are going to have 6 entries in our positional encoding vector. First, we're going to create a vector of zeros that is the length d, meaning it has one entry per item that's going to be in our positional encoding. Then we loop through all of the indices from 0 all the way to d divided by 2. Remember, because we're adding pairs of things, we only need to add d over 2 pairs to get our vector of length d. Once we do that for each of these indices, we are going to add both a sine and a cosine to our vector. And of course, these will both vary based on what our position is as well as what the output dimension is of our vector. As you can see, as we loop through, this line of code is going to add each of our sine entries, and this line of code is going to add all of our cosine entries. Because we're adding two entries on every iteration of the for loop, that's why we only have to loop through from zero to d over two. Now, this is just a visualization I made of what these positional encoding vectors might look like. When we take a single row from this visualization, it tells us what would the positional encoding vector be for the item at this position. In this case, we're actually looking at a 30-dimensional positional encoding vector. And here, this is what it would look like at position 1. And this is what it would look like at position 1, and position 2, and position 3. You can see that we could do this for all the other rows, but I'll stop there. And the number of items in a sequence, aka what positions, can be possible, as well as the dimensions of the positional encoding vector, can be varied. This, for example, is that same visualization using the dimensions mentioned in the paper, Attention is All You Need, where their positional encodings are 512 elements long. And you can see with these unique combinations of sine and cosine, we can use these positional encoding vectors to give our model information about the position of an item in a sequence. So instead of adding things like vectors of indices or even scaled vectors of indices, we are going to take our original word embeddings and add these positional encoding vectors that are made up of pairs of sine and cosine. But of course, as we move to the next item in the sequence, the position in the cosine and sine functions are going to increase. So then we end up with our original word embeddings, which gives us semantic meaning of the words, along with a positional encoding that gives us information about where in a sequence an item is. Because we've taken our word embeddings and injected information about the position of that item in the sequence, we can now feed all of our different words into the model concurrently. This, of course, speeds up our processing as well as makes these models parallelizable, which means we can do a lot more in the same amount of time. So today, we learned about what happens when we take individual word tokens and process them in a way that prepares them to be processed by the transformer model. First, we talked about the fact that we have to take our different words and make word embeddings. This could be something that is learned by the model itself, or we could use pre-trained word embeddings like word to vec Then, because we learned that the model is not going to process data sequentially, but rather all at one time, we had to inject positional information about our sequence into the word embeddings themselves. We did this through positional encoding, which takes sine and cosine waves and gives us a way of representing each position uniquely with a positional encoding vector. We then take that vector and add it to the word embedding so that now our new update embedding has both information about the semantic meaning of the word, which we got from the word embedding, as well as the positional information that we added using positional encoding. Now our vectors are ready to get put through the transformer model, and because the positional information is encoded in the word representation, we no longer have to feed our items in sequentially. We can give the model all of the words in our sequence at a single time.
And once we have those sequences of words that have both word meaning as well as positional information, we can then actually start to feed them into the transformer architecture and take advantage of that attention mechanism we've been talking so much about. But I will save that for the next lecture. That's all I have for you. I will see you next time.